At midnight on New Year's Eve 2010, I had the strangest experience of my life. I was visited by an eight-foot-tall praying mantis entity. The encounter changed me as an artist and a spiritual seeker. And years later, I'm still trying to understand that event and all that followed, which included my family seeing a UFO, crazy synchronicities, auditory anomalies, and disturbing dreams. My name is Stuart Davis. I've been an artist full-time for 27 years. I work in music, TV, and film. Examining my experience with the Mantis entity led me to discover that many artists have reported encounters with non-human entities. Contact with these enigmatic others radically impacts their artwork and lives. This series is about contact between artists and non-human intelligences. I wanted to meet other artists who've had these experiences and hear their stories in their words. And since I'm asking artists to share intimate details about these bizarre, transformative, and sometimes traumatic experiences, it only seems fair that I start by sharing mine. It begins with fevers. When I was growing up, I had frequent high fevers, often in the 104 to 105 degree range. I gradually became fascinated by them, and I came to regard them as a glimpse into another reality. I would tell myself, remember what I'm experiencing in this fever, but when the fever would break, the experience was always gone, and it was as though the means to decipher whatever was special inside that experience vanished as soon as it did. Skip ahead to age 23, I began meditating. After practicing meditation a while, I had this idea that it would be cool to meditate during a high fever, because the two were such standout experiences in my life. But around the time that I have that idea, I stop getting high fevers. I don't know why, I just do. So I keep meditating, but I never get the chance to combine meditation with a high fever. Until New Year's Eve, 2010. It had been New Year's Eve and Stuart had been super sick and I had gone out with my girlfriends and had a fun party and we got in a big fight that night because I came home with all my crazy girlfriends and he was mad at me. I'm home alone, very sick, in bed, sweating profusely and it's my first high fever in many years. Around 11.30 p.m., I remember my old idea to meditate with a fever. This will be an interesting way to bring in the new year, I think to myself. So I meditate, and the atmosphere softens, a vague presence animates the room, which is not unusual for a meditative state. As midnight approaches, I spontaneously decide to ask the fever a question. And without much thought, I ask the fever if I can meet my spiritual guides. I'm thinking maybe some dead monks or lesser Buddhist deities. What appears is an eight foot tall praying mantis. It stands at the foot of my bed, not perfectly insectoid, there's no antenna, but it's definitely a praying mantis entity. It's wearing a purple robe with a high collar. It immediately shoots a powerful signal into my body. Like being hit with an invisible fire hose. It's not painful, but it's electrifying. The signal contains clicks, pops, information, something akin to music, and it's all nonverbal. This lasts 10 or 15 seconds. When it's done, the thought remember who you work for, lands in my head. Then the mantis disappears, and this whole episode lasts less than a minute. The next morning, the fever is broken, but the experience reverberates in my body and remains vivid in my mind. I find it bizarre, to say the least. I tell my wife about it, 
and then just move on with my life because what am I going to do with something like that anyway? The next day, he had said to me a giant mantis had visited him and given some kind of gigantic download into his existence. From that evening on, he has had a vision. He's been given a different reality that he acts from. Years later, we're living in Amsterdam, and I meet an artist named Jasmine Karamova. We sign her to my record label, and we release her debut album, which I produce. But something else happens the first time that I meet Jasmine. I see a movie in my head. Nearly fully formed, it's about a teenage victim of human trafficking. She's Russian. Just as she's about to murder her captor, she finds a praying mantis insect. And this mantis insect triggers a paranormal awakening in her life. And I just see this whole movie in my head with Jasmine playing the lead. And I also feel clear that this movie was somehow inside of this signal that that mantis shot into my body on New Year's Eve. It's like whatever happened that night somehow included this film. So I read a 10-page outline of the movie, and then I set it aside because no one will want to make a paranormal sex trafficking movie in Russian. Fast forward a couple years, we move back to the United States, and one night I'm lying on my back in this park in front of my house, just waiting for my dog to do his business. I observe a large white orb moving horizontally across the sky, and there are no stars visible, it's still early in the night, and the orb is about the size of my pinky fingernail held out at arm's length. It crosses a large portion of the sky horizontally, and then it stops dead still and remains stationary. I'm totally electrified when I see it stop still. After a minute or two, it moves again, but this time vertically at a right angle from its previous path. Then I think that thing, whatever it is, just moved at a right angle. And I want to go get someone, but I'm afraid if I move, it's going to vanish. And I also have this weird feeling like it's aware of me, maybe, or that somehow it's there for me, like a private show. Once again, I feel like somehow it's linked to that mantis visitation. After those thoughts, I feel like this is crazy. Maybe I'm going nuts. And so I want to get another witness (laughs) to see if this is not all in my head. So I hurry home and I get my daughter and she joins me on the rooftop deck of our house. Come here and look at this. Two times it moved at a 90 90 degree angle. Then it stopped. Then it moved up, straight up. Stopped. Then it went over. Stopped. Then it went straight up. Look in here. That's crazy. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I look closely. It looks like it has little windows. <laughs> so nuts. It moved. It did? Yeah, it, it was over there. Can we just. What the <laughs> That's heck? That's crazy. That is so weird. There's no way that you'll get this contextually unless you're unless you're us go ahead you can put your eye up against it add why are there three of them now you can see in it that it's a diagonal line yeah it is a totally diagonal thing it is horizontal that is not a sphere it's almost shaped like a v look at it it's almost shaped like a v What the fuck is it? You can, even in this lens, you can see there's clearly a horizontal, it's long. Yeah. There's length to it. It's wide. Like it's not circular. That is fucking not a sphere. There's no way. It's 
10 times brighter than everything in the sky. It is clearly a horizontal line. How many lights do you think there are in that horizontal plane, Ara? Well, I see three. Yeah. Three, maybe more, lights in a horizontal plane. Totally distinct from every other thing in the sky. There's, first of all, there's, we can't even see anything else in the sky. Like Watching it, I feel like it's not just an object. It's not just an unidentified flying object. It feels to me like there's a subjective presence and intelligence behind it. So my daughter and I go and get my wife and we get my other daughter and the whole family comes up on the rooftop deck. We all watch it for a long time. They were very excited. They were like, come up, come up. And I walked upstairs and they told me to look through the telescope camera. Yep, sure enough, there was a spot in the sky. Just look through this lens. Let's look through here. How would you describe that? Three dots. Get your eye up real close. Describe that. Three dots. Three fucking dots in a horizontal plane. Would you say... Like, say you're crazy, I'm tired, good night. <laughs> My negative ninny wife sees exactly the same thing that I see and my daughter sees. I mean, there's lights in the sky, but I don't know. <laughs> and I didn't think that was too exciting. So I went back downstairs and I went to bed. Ara and I keep watching it. Aliens. How much brain capacity do you think the aliens have? So dad, one of us gets abducted by aliens tonight. It's good. Then I go downstairs to go to the bathroom, and when I leave, the object moves again. It moved! I swear to God it moved. Yeah, it definitely moved. Huh? It definitely moved. Yeah. Big time. It's like this, and it moves like this, and then after that it went doot. And it like stopped for like five seconds, and went do again, and like stopped for ten seconds, and it like, and it went do again. Well, I'm convinced that we have spotted a UFO. What the fuck? And then, as we're both watching, the configuration of three lights that is visible only in the lens moves. Is that the lights right? moved. Huh? The lights moved. They, the were, they were in a line, and now they're in like a triangular shape. Let it focus for a second, you can see it. It goes from a line to a triangle formation. I'm telling you, it's a UFO. But, but I didn't get that part on film. Well, maybe they know that people are watching them, so they stop. You see, Dad, it would make much more sense because maybe, because it moves whatever you would inside. The whole thing is funny. It was moving when I was not filming it, and then I film it, and it doesn't move, of course. And then you're watching it and it moves when I'm gone. It's the only thing visible in the sky. I don't know, let's go in. And eventually we get bored and go to bed. I give up. When they start interacting with us and we have interpersonal relationships with them, I'll probably be excited about them. But until then, it's just a spot in the sky that just feels like an object to me. So it doesn't make me too excited, so I go back to bed. That's your interpersonal relationship. I don't feel, I don't feel like anybody's contacting me. So I'm not moved, not moved by it. From the very first articulation of Mantis, it sang, like, it just possessed me. I, it was amazing. Soon after this, I meet a producer in L.A. named Siona. I just remember sort of slipping out and being like, that's it, that's it, this is the movie, we're making this movie. She hears the short pitch for the movie Mantis, and she buys the film the next day. Yeah. 
I didn't have it. I had decided it, it was even before that. Do you remember you gave me that first little paragraph pitch way earlier, and I kept asking you about it. I was like, tell tell me about that mantis. Like, say more about that mantis movie. I actually try to talk Siona out of buying this movie. And how much do you remember of me trying to talk you out of doing this? Uh, quite a bit. I just feel like it's so weird. It's such a fucked up story. Yeah, there, there was a decent amount of trying to argue me into sanity or something. You're like, oh, I've only done the beats and whatever. I'm like, the Mantis movie, like, tell me more about that. That first paragraph possessed me. And after some back and forth, I sell her the script. And then I bought it and then spent a couple months and just like, I think like, oh my God, what, what have they done? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about that. Well, because it hadn't even been written yet, you know? I, I didn't know if the script was going to be any good at all, and it was not a small investment, at least for me. <laughs> so there was a little bit of that like, well, I hope I'm sort of trusting the right thing here. I end up writing the full film. When you sent me that first draft, what was it, in February? That was, again, one of the moments of absolute pure affirmation. I remember sitting there reading it, and it, again, was one of those that was just like, oh my god, this is, this is the thing. Like, this is, this is it. While writing the script for Mantis, a series of synchronicities occur for me and for other people who come onto the project. One day I'm at the dog park and I'm on my phone talking to a film industry person about the Mantis movie. And I'm saying, is this ever going to get made? Is it ever going to get funded? I'm just kind of complaining about the difficulty of the process. And as I'm speaking these words, a praying Mantis insect flies up and lands on my foot. I have never seen a praying Mantis insect in the wild before. Here's one crawling on my foot. So I hang up the call, I take a bunch of photos of this mantis insect, and it just sits there and looks at me. Again, I have this distinct sense that whatever is behind these experiences, it is personally aware of me and intentionally interacting with me somehow, which is enchanted and magical, but it also gives me the chills and feels a little eerie. This kind of event occurs repeatedly, numerous times someone comes on to the Mantis film project and then has a praying mantis insect visit them physically. Producer Eleonora Granada Jenkins was one of the first to support our film, Mantis. She was at home waiting for Siona to arrive for a meeting about the movie when this happened. So about the episode of uh, the Mantis, what happened was that um, I was introduced to this project uh, with an outline. I got, uh, you know, familiar with this uh, script. Uh, then I spoke to Siona before um, she was coming here. I was waiting for uh, Siona to arrive. Uh, long story short, uh, uh, the day that uh, they were coming to my house, I opened the door, the main door, and there was this uh, strange animal. I never saw this insect uh, in my garden. And I am like always in the garden. So it's not like uh, I, I didn't pay attention and so on. This mantis was right in the front door. Like she was expecting to come inside. And looked up and I took picture. And I, and I just couldn't believe my eyes because she was not moving. She was not going anywhere. She just wanted to come in. It's just like uh, this insect, uh, it felt like he had a purpose. I mean, I, and I called my husband, I say, look at this, you know, what, what is it doing this, and, and why is it not moving, and why is like uh, really there? Like I say, okay, I'm here, and I'm coming in, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> it was weird, it's like a little man, a little, little persona. I took then, you know, a piece of paper, and I lifted, and I put it in the garden someplace, then when Siona came, he might say, well, it's so weird you're talking about your film and so on, because for the first time I have a close encounter with this insect, and here it is, look. And I have to tell you, my front door is really kind of peculiar, because we have something like uh, 40 big steps to go to the main door. So it's like a big staircase. The steps are kind of wide and all in uh, terracotta. 
So it's not like an environment where the prey mantis say, okay, let's go there because that's where I live. Not at all. And so she came, this animal came all the way there. So that that's was the peculiarity of all this. But it's extremely weird that, that this thing happening. Our cinematographer, the day he receives the script, he finds a praying mantis insect on his front doorstep. This is our executive producer, Serena. The minute that I opened the script, I remember exactly where I was and what transpired because it was life-changing. She had never seen a mantis insect before, but when she started reading the script, they began showing up. It's around 10.30 p.m. The house is all locked up. I got into the third page of Mantis, and the front door came flying open, like somebody had walked in. I was first astounded because I thought, well, my grandma's asleep. Maybe my sister came to visit. I yelled for my sister's name. Nobody answered, and I got up, and I looked, and the door was locked, so, and nobody else had the key except for my grandma and myself. It's like, well, that's bizarre, and there wasn't any strong winds. I was like, okay, Someone just walked in the house. <laughs> this is my paranormal activity going on. Close the door and lock it. Go back to reading the script and let's try not to put too much energy on it because it's kind of freaking me out. <laughs> and then the lights started flickering. And then I was like, okay, there's, there's something much bigger here that's going on. I woke up the next morning and I was taking Pumpkin to go to the bathroom and I, there's a shuffle in the bushes. And I look up and right in front of my face, is a praying mantis eating a dragonfly. And I had all these different emotions of front doors opening, lights are flickering. I wake up the next day, a praying mantis is in my face, and I'm just like, wow. I've never even actually encountered a praying mantis in my entire life other than what you see in books. And I called Fiona, and I was like, you're not going to believe this. And I took pictures and video. And then a couple days passed and I was sitting on the front porch of my grandma's home and a brown, reddish baby praying mantis came up on the railing right next to where I was sitting and I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. And so I just talked to it. I was just, I connected with this amazing praying mantis and it literally stayed with me for one week. I would come out on the porch and do work and every day I would look for it and it would be somewhere on the railing, I would find it. Again, a week later, I was on a hike with my sister, and I was telling my sister about the mantis stories and how they were just showing up and how magical it was. And she's like, oh my gosh, Serena, stop. Look, Look down on the ground. And I was like, what? This is Serena's sister, Rachel. In that moment of her speaking and talking about it, that whole hike and on our way back from the hike, there is this beautiful white prey mantis right in the middle. And she didn't even recognize it. Like, I had to stop her. I'm like, Serena, wait, you, you have to stop right now. Look. She's like, look. It was like a white prey mantis crossing the path that we were on. Wait, look, 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 look. She's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Are you serious? I'm like, yes, yes. And we were both just like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Like, are you really kidding me right now? Like, like this is so crazy right now. I literally have the chills, like, even just repeating this. Like, wow, it was very magical, like so beautiful. And it was, it was white and it was so beautiful. But I, I Googled that shit. I was like, um, is this for real? <laughs> like, it, yeah, a white prey mantis. That's the thing. It was like the signs of everything. Like, yes, this is right. This film is going to be amazing. I was like, Siona, this is, this is a sign. I mean, I've never experienced such a profound sign before. When I was in Hawaii, I was walking on this beautiful path next to my friend's place in Kauai. And again, I saw these bushes move and I just went closer to look. And it was this amazing, beautiful green praying mantis, again, that I stopped and I I had a conversation with. And I said, thank you so much for showing up. And I love you. And I'm working on towards bringing you to life. And I took a picture of it and a video of it. And I had to share it with Fiona because I'm like, look who I found in Hawaii. I've never seen them before in my life. And to have them show up the way they did, all different colors. I didn't even know there was different colors. I didn't even, I'm I'm just in awe. I feel like it's more than just a synchronicity. It's it's the universe communicating with us that we're making this film. It, It has to be made. It's just freaking magic. A particularly moving mantis synchronicity is Joel's. Joel was the line producer on Mantis, and he was the first person Siona hired after me on the project. 
Hey, Fiona, it's Joel. Um, so, I just finished your budget, finally. When he joined Mantis, he had terminal cancer. He knew it, but he didn't tell anyone working on the movie. Mantis was the last film he ever worked on. This is his wife, Jana. Yes, your film was the last one he was slated to go into production with, yeah. Joel passed away on August 8th, 2017. You know, when Joel passed away, uh, I was convinced and then, then obsessed that he would, you know, somehow show up. Like, I just, I couldn't fathom that I'd never communicate with him again. So I was always looking for signs. I don't really have any strong spiritual belief. I'm open, but I need, I need proof in my faith kind of thing. The first sort of sign was when I flew to uh, Cedar Rapids for the funeral we had there with his family. That's where he grew up. My family picked me up at the airport and, you know, we loaded the luggage in the car and everything. And then all of a sudden this huge, a huge praying mantis landed on the side near. My sister immediately said, that's Joel. So then we got driving and sort of hit the highway and this thing was like just hanging on for you know, probably another good five minutes on the on the highway going 80 an hour. So that kind of started to convince me, like, just that this thing's able to do that and that he, just the timing of when he landed, like, just we're all, like, family together for this reason. In May of 2018, the hospital where Joel passed away had a memorial. And we were each given a rock to represent our loved one. We wrote her, the person's name on the rock, and I was you know, speaking to my friends and telling them about this dream I'd recently had. We both knew that he was going to die in the dream, and I asked them, are you going to be able to come back and visit me? And in the dream, he just sort of shrugged his shoulders and this sort of playful look in his face. And then just as I was telling them that, this dream I had, this praying mantis came and landed first on our friend Stephen. The other friend, Jolene, who's with us. Immediately she said, that's Joel. And she was in the room also when Joel passed away. And then he came and landed on the rock that I was holding. And he just, it was probably a good, a good 10 minutes. And he was kind of like rocking back and forth in this cute little dance. And this was like a much smaller one, but it was just, it was just cute and playful. Like a, for a bug to have so much personality, it was mind blowing. And we were just sort of, you know, marveling over it and laughing and everything. And, you know, our friend Jolene was like, that's Joel. When we were inside, I had this feeling coming over me that Joel was going to show himself. So then she said, that's Joel. He's going to crawl up your leg or something, like under your dress. <laughs> and then sure enough, the bug <laughs> the bug kind of like flew up and then landed on the ground beside my foot and then jumped up on my foot and started crawling up my leg. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm no joke. And she had just said that and that's what he did. So, <laughs> and that would be Joel, you know. So yeah, I was quite convinced after that. All right. You know how to get a hold of me? I know how to get a hold of you. Let's talk. Move forward. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Now, there's only about 20 people working on the movie at this point, and about a dozen of them have had mantis insects show up when they start working on the movie. In November of 2017, we film the teaser for the mantis feature film. Soon after that, the original script grows to become a trilogy. I remember being hit by what felt like the the magnitude of that whole trilogy. All three of these films sell to Siona and 5HT2A, that, that same company in L.A. that bought the first film. The only answer to that was producing this work. I was like, I, I can't explain this. All, all I know how to do now is to move forward and, and follow the, the breadcrumbs of this production. You know, it's like, just keep showing up, just keep showing up for it. Now, in each case, when I'm writing the script to Mantis 1, Mantis 2, and Mantis 3, I feel like they're all linked to that initial visit from the Mantis entity on New Year's Eve. Don't get me wrong, I did write these movies. I'm not saying they were channeled or anything like that. It's more like my creativity was seeded or somehow oriented by that original visit. At this point in the story, I still feel like the Mantis visitation could simply be the product of my own higher self or some variety of a muse or a daemon or the imaginal capacity of my own person. But those interpretations 
begin to feel less plausible because of what happens next. Inspired by all the synchronicities with the mantis insects, I decide that I should try another experiment. So I start waking up at three o'clock in the morning to meditate on my rooftop deck. And I focus my mind and direct my intention to calling back the mantis, to summoning whatever was behind the mantis and that unidentified flying object slash subject that my whole family watched on the rooftop deck. So for weeks, I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I go up on the rooftop and I meditate and I try to summon the mantis entity. Nothing happens. And eventually I give up. Then something happens. On January 19th, 2018, I wake up at 3.33 in the morning. As cheesy as that sounds, yes, that's the actual time on my phone when I get up. And there's coyotes going crazy in my neighborhood. I sit up and I listen and they stop. And the neighborhood is dead silent. Then I hear two loud reverberations. like a massive tuning fork being struck outside over the top of my house. And the sound is in reverse, just like someone is playing a recording of a massive tuning fork in reverse <laughs> floating over the top of my house. So this gets my attention because as a music producer, this is one of my favorite tricks. It's to reverse a part in the mix in order to create a more surreal atmosphere. And in fact, I do this so often as a music producer that it's a running joke among the artists that I've worked with. But not just that. Reversibility is also a basic feature of a language that I constructed as a kind of art project. And this language is called is. I've worked on it for many years and Words in this language are directional. The meaning of a word depends on which direction it is pointed or spoken. So a native speaker of the is language would be able to speak any word forward or backwards with equal ease, altering the meaning by inverting the direction. Hearing the sound of a reversed tuning fork hoovering over my house feels personal and specific to me. Eventually it stops, and once it stops, the coyotes begin howling wildly again. They just form this bizarre bookends on the experience, like coyotes going crazy, silence, reverse tuning fork, silence, coyotes go crazy. So I put earplugs in my ears and I go back to bed. On January 29th, 2018, at 3.13 in the morning, I wake up again to the sound of another reversed tuning fork. It repeats the same pattern, sounding twice, then a period of space. I sit up in bed and it's clear, it's just above my house again. I go to the open window, I lean out, and the sound is moving a bit, it's hovering, but it always stays just over the top of my house somewhere. But I can't see anything, and so I walk around the house, and I'm sticking my head out various windows to try to gauge the position of the sound. It's close, but I don't see anything. So I go to my lower deck, which is about 20 feet below the upper deck, and I look up, and I want to go up to the upper deck to investigate, but I am strangely scared to go out onto the upper deck. My dog, a large Doberman Pinscher, 100 pound protection dog, can also hear this very clearly. His ears are perked up, he's tracking the sound with his head, but he refuses to get off the bed and go outside with me. The neighborhood is dead silent aside from this sound, and I feel this is again somehow in response to my meditation sessions on the upper deck, and it 
just scares the shit out of me. And I have no idea why. I just stand at the threshold of my open door, embarrassed, but paralyzed by an inexplicable fear. So, unable to go outside, once again, I just go back into my bedroom, and I put earplugs in and go back to bed. When I wake up the next day, I feel like an idiot, and I feel like I should start waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning again and meditating on the roof, and that basically, in a nutshell, I need to suck it up and get some balls, and so I do. I start waking up in the middle of the night again, 3 o'clock in the morning, go up on the deck, meditate, and again, nothing happens. (laughs) As soon as I do this, the strange shit stops happening which, again, makes me feel crazy. So again, I quit. March 9th, 2018, at 3.03 in the morning, my wife and I both wake up to the sound of coyotes. And again, they're howling like crazy for a minute, and then they stop, and there's dead silence. And then, my wife and I both hear a hearing test in the sky. Not a reverse tuning fork, a hearing test. You woke me up and you're like, you hear it, you hear it. And I was like, yeah, I hear it. And this is another sound that has a personal significance for me. As a kid, I had chronic ear infections. Those ear infections were what led to most of those high fevers and also some hearing loss. And so I had to have hearing tests. And so hearing tests have a special place in my childhood memory because of that. Hearing one now over my house, I am creeped the fuck out. It feels invasively personal because this is like a special little detail of a memory from my childhood. And then you're like, let's go up on the deck. No, but you were afraid to go up on the deck. Just like the reversed tuning fork, the hearing test hovers above my house somewhere. And my wife and I are both awake, we're walking around, She hears the same thing I do, and again, I want to go out on the upper deck and investigate, but I'm totally scared. I'm completely frightened, and I don't know why, and my wife refuses to go outside with me. I wasn't afraid to go up on the deck, but it was 3.03 in the morning, and I just wanted to go to bed, but I heard it. I mean, just like the light... Like, there's plenty of things that it could have been, and I just wanted to go back to bed. You make me do all these things. She goes back to bed, literally pulls the covers over her head, and goes back to sleep and says, leave me alone. (laughs) I mean, it was not made up. There was noises. There were lights. I just don't know exactly what they are, and I'm probably not going to figure it out, so I just wanted to go to bed. (laughs) So, I try to get my dog to go out with me again. He will not leave the bed. I just stand at the open door of my lower deck and listen. And I feel like, this is ridiculous. I don't know what I'm afraid of. This just feels to me like it's somehow linked to the mantis visitation. And I can't bring myself to go out there. Yeah, because you want us to go into your crazy world and we want to go to bed. I go back inside and... Third time's a charm, I put earplugs in, and I go back to sleep. But this time, when I go back to sleep, I dream that I am meditating on the rooftop deck. And in the dream, I'm trying to call the mantis entity in, and I see that huge orb in the sky, the same one my family saw. And... I know it is sentient, and it starts racing toward me. It's expanding in size, and I am petrified. I'm just frozen, because I know it's going to kill me. And just as the orb is about to impact with my body, I wake up. And as I wake up in bed, I see the huge white orb out my bedroom window. And then I wake up again. And this time, I realize that I... I'm staring at the full moon, and I've been dreaming with my eyes open. It takes me 
30 seconds, 60 seconds to understand that that moon is not the real orb. And there's just adrenaline coursing through my body. I start laughing. This is absurd. And then I get insomnia and I can't fall back asleep again. A few weeks later, Siona, the movie producer, has a dream in which she realizes that I have an implant in my right shoulder. Oh, it was such a good dream. I remember it was in your shoulder, but there was also like a symbol. There were a set of symbols on top of it, and that's how you could tell like where this implant thing was. Now, I never told her about this. I know I didn't because I've never told anyone about this. But since I was a kid, I have had a small round lump the size of a BB in my right shoulder. And I remember like writing down in the dream journal like what the symbols were. It was a triangle with these two splashes after it, I believe, and then some symbols underneath. I have always felt weirdly suspicious that it's an implant or that it has an exotic origin, and it's still there. I'm actually touching it while I speak these words. Then I remember vividly enough like what that looked like to go ahead and write it down. But that was the marker that that was that made it clear that it was like some, I don't want to say extraterrestrial, but some sort of like other implant that it came from someplace else. It bothers me, much like the scoop mark scar in my left leg, which I've always regarded with suspicion and unease. And again, this is all totally ridiculous. It's irrational. I feel embarrassed by it. But when she tells me this dream, it again just feels like, what the fuck? That's absurd. How do I account for my producer having a dream in which my secret fear is revealed to her as true in this dream realm? It's weird. It gets weirder. After Siona's dream and my paralyzing fear of harmless sounds over my house, I decide that I need to do something. I need to be proactive. So I make a list of options, right? So should I go see a psychic? Should I see a therapist? Should I see a regressive hypnotherapist? After searching, a friend of mine who is a shaman recommends a Buddhist shaman to me. And this Buddhist shaman has 30 years of experience dealing with unusual, anomalous stuff. I think, I don't know, I'm a Buddhist practitioner. Maybe this person will be uniquely suited to deal with my situation. So I book a session. The shaman does an hour of preliminary work with me. And then after that, she tells me that she thinks that I should channel the mantis entity that originally visited me. I say I've never channeled anything. She says she'll train me. And she will then ask the mantis entity a list of questions that I have prepared in advance. (sighs) Jesus. I feel like every day with this puzzle, I slide deeper into batshit. But I'm very curious, and I don't have good options, and I'm more curious than I am apprehensive. So, fuck it. Let's channel a mantis. On March 30th, 2018, we do it. The shaman guides me through a set of techniques which will allow me to channel this mantis. Once I'm in the quote unquote altered state and the mantis begins to inhabit me, so to speak, a bright strobing light flashes behind my eyelids. This is Lorelei the shamanic healer that I worked with. The thing that I remember most is that your your room and you glowed when the conversation started happening with them. Your voice changed too, yeah. It's like I'm staring into the sun with my eyes closed if the sun were a strobe light. And that continues until the channeling session is done. Using my tongue, this ostensible entity spins quite a tale. I'm going to skip telling you what my questions were because I think the mantis responding makes it clear what it is I was asking. The responses to these questions seem to come as colors and shapes which morph inside of the strobing light in my field of vision 
And then I guess what happens is they're filtered into my brain. Here now are 10 things a channeled mantis told me. 1. Fear is okay. They don't resent me for being afraid to go out on the roof at night. They showed up on New Year's Eve in my bedroom, and physical buildings are not an impediment to contact. The important point is my deeper fear is of my own potential, not of mantis entities. If the mantises wished me or anyone harm, that would be abundantly clear. I have nothing to fear on the other side of that event horizon whenever I choose to cross it. 2. In that first visit, the message, remember who you work for, was in English so that I would have something recognizable to keep me curious about the rest of the nonverbal transmission. Remember who you work for doesn't mean that I work for the mantis, it means remember my own deepest values, follow them, and that will protect me and guide me. It's an injunction, not a threat. 3. Mantis entities are real ontological others that come from a place physical human bodies don't inhabit or understand. The mantis entities do have a presence on various physical worlds, and Earth is one of those. 4. Praying mantis insects are related to the big mantises. The 2400 species of insect mantises are nodes or physical echoes of the original large mantis entities. They gifted them to Earth tens of millions of years ago. The synchronicities that I've had and others have had with praying mantis insects are related to the larger mantis entities. They're part of their signaling. 5. They are not malevolent. They respect my family's autonomy, and they are not menacing any of us. In fact, they often protect us. 6. There is a disequilibrium in the mantis-human dynamic. Metaphorically, each time there's contact, they travel 100 increments of distance for every one that I do. The more that I train my body and mind as a relay, the easier and deeper the exchange can become. 7. They experience time in a way that humans don't. They don't experience my many lifetimes, for example, as a succession of events which occur in sequence. 8. I'm not being abducted by greys. However, because mantis entities work with grey entities, there is an overlap. That's why I feel familiarity and recognition with people who've had contact with greys. 9. They were the authors of the nocturnal anomalies and sounds over the top of my house. These signals are evoked in sympathetic resonance with existing features in my mind and experience. They need to be personal and specific so as to be unmistakable. 10. Alcohol is the biggest block in my professed desire to have conscious interactions with the mantis. Binge drinking two nights a week knocks out four nights of signal from them. They don't feel angry or resentful about this, but it does indicate that I'm conflicted and ambivalent. The limits are imposed by me, not them. This is Lorelai again. It can be a little frightening and disconcerting, which is, I think, what you were experiencing for a long time that, that you weren't sure if, they, if it was positive or negative. They were just sort of knocking on your psychic doors. And when we're not trained in these non-physical communications, it can be confusing, it can be disorienting, and, and we can be very unsure about it. I do know the difference between a being who is not friendly and controlling that was another thing that was really key for me with the mantis is I asked them that if you wanted them to leave you alone, would they do that? And they said, absolutely. That's the hallmark of a being that is more highly evolved. Over the years, I've done a lot of research on human encounters with mantis entities. They're not common, but they're not unheard of either. And I discovered that one of my personal friends had an encounter with one of these entities about 200 miles from where my house is. This is my friend Bobby. It probably was around 20 years ago, the late 90s. I was staying at a friend's house in Aspen, lived on top of a mountain there that overlooked Snowmass. I'm going to guess it was about 3.30, 4, 4.30 in the morning, and I woke up 
My mind woke up, but my body was completely paralyzed. It was just this, you know, right by the bed there, standing over me was, I'm going to guess, a six, seven foot mantis. Ghost-like. I wouldn't say it was fully material. It was, it was, uh, it was spectral, but it was, it was like from another dimension, but it wasn't fully physical. It wasn't fully present in physical space. I was in a fear state, but I couldn't move any of my limbs. My mind was trying to kind of process what was going on because I'd never heard of anything like this before. And I was, uh, probably present with it for about five minutes and then I regained control over my limbs and the fear subsided and I had this sense you know and I didn't have any evidence for it but I had this sense that it was taking samples out of my emotional body or kind of subtle bodies it was taking samples there I don't it wasn't any kind of physical intrusion or invasion it was an assessment like they were using some, or the, it was using some kind of uh, assessment technology for whatever purposes. If I had to just assign my sense of gender, I, I felt it was a male. It was more dark greenish or greenish blackish. The eyes didn't stand out for me as much as just the shape of the body, you know the long extended torso, the particular thin nature of the arms, you know, I mean, definitely mantis, like the shape of the head, and it wasn't using any tools, so if we think of like a geologist taking a sample, you know, we usually visualize a type of tool drilling into the earth, and then it's pulling up core samples or layer, you know, I that was the association, though, was that sampling where layers of information if you could imagine uh, some type of piece of equipment that could sample all subtle strata all causal strata and you would have kind of readings at, in the biofield region you'd have read, re, uh, readings in the emotional kind of region or strata you'd have reaching uh, you know readings in the mental strata you know, you place it in some kind of spectrometer or something, and it gives you kind of a printout or digital readout of, of analysis of sorts. I didn't feel transformed by it in any particular imaginal or creative way. Basically, it was an, it, for me, it was an empirical experience, in, in, you know, within the overall kind of phenomenology of different phenomenologies of different experiences I've had that our outside consensus reality it just kind of validated for me you know the existence of these other life forms that really haven't been properly identified and cataloged or acknowledged i mean it was more on the lines was was you know like a, was i just randomly sampled and was this a particular evening in which they were taking a lot of samples and then they would take the, take this data and they would they would assess certain segments or types of the population. I found it astonishing to hear that one of my personal friends had an encounter with a mantis entity 20 years before mine. I wondered how many other people have had these experiences. So I did more research and I discovered what may be the wildest synchronicity of all in this mantis odyssey. At the 2016 International UFO Congress, Jacqueline Smith was one of the presenters, and she relates the details of being visited by mantis entities on New Year's Eve. I had seven mantis beings in my house on New Year's Eve, and they were came into quite a dense, in dense form, which I was very surprised, and they said, we're able to do this today and the veils are dropping and many people are going to be experiencing this more. I mean, what the actual fuck? <laughs> so, of course, I called her, she told me her story, and I told her mine. Well, I think it's kind of interesting. They showed up here for me at 12 noon, and they showed up for you at 12 midnight. I think that's, that's an interesting link there. And the mantis do visit many people. 
but I think that um, you know you are linked with the mantis beings uh, as I am I have mantis DNA in me and and so I I feel um, I get this feeling that that actually we know each other <laughs> in terms of that mantis link and so they visited you and I and, and a number of other people who um, we could say who are connected in in regard to um, the mantis. You know, the mantis relate to all of us in whatever way is appropriate for each person individually. In the bigger sense, the mantis, they are very creative beings. They, I could say, are artists. They create music through frequency. I've heard it. They do create poetry. So they actually help to create sacred geometry. They are true co-creators. They help set up the grids for Earth, other star systems. They are masters of genetic code. They're highly evolved. They are very creative beings, so it makes sense to me that that would be connected to and coming through your films, your music, and whatever else you might be doing in a creative sense, being linked with them. You know, they were clearly wanting to connect with you. They downloaded you with lots of information. And there usually is some kind of connection, like a past life connection, a connection that you have for the mantis to come to you. So I am getting a, a strong um, a strong connection, of course, between you and the mantis. You have been a mantis in a past life. And you volunteered to come here to Earth to do the wonderful work that you're doing to really help people understand more about the mantis. They are all from interdimensional, what they call interdimensional folds. They are not from, quote, a planet or a star. Long before this universe ever was, they were. <laughs> they are one of the most ancient races. When they came to me on New Year's Eve, they were in quasi-physical form, which means, I mean, I could really, uh, they were between physical state and etheric state, but I could actually touch them and feel them. Part of this is they're trying to assist humanity with evolving, because we've gotten stuck and destroyed ourselves at least four or five times. They are trying to help us understand that we're all cosmic citizens. That's a really basic key understanding that they're trying to relay. But the beings who I have been connected to are very highly evolved loving beings who care about the earth. And the mantis beings are one of those groups. Now, there are other beings which I don't connect to and we don't even need to talk about all of it, but, but who have other agendas. There's, there's the whole spectrum, just like there, you know, if we look at the human race, there are humans who are very highly evolved and then there are beings who are not so highly evolved to rape and kill and so on. Just as there's a full spectrum of humans, that's also true of other beings as well. After my call with Jacqueline, I go to the gym to try and process my emotions around the fact that we both had visitations on New Year's Eve. And when I arrive at the gym door, I go to touch my electronic key to the keypad, and there is a praying mantis insect perched on the keypad, staring directly at me. I take photos and videos, and one of its antennae is cut in half. It flies down onto my left foot. It sways gently for a couple minutes, stares at me intently, and then it flies away. It's the second praying mantis I've ever seen in the wild. And as I'm looking at it, I remember something Jacqueline said about the relationship between the big mantis entities and the mantis insects. 
The mantis beings are actually able to look through the praying mantis's eyes. So we could say that the praying mantises here on Earth are very distant cousins, but they do look through the praying mantis's eyes, so there is that link, and they're kind of monitoring things. This idea that the mantis entities can actually temporarily look out through a mantis insect's eyes really puts a new frame on all the synchronicities that we've had with these insects. Now, I will say that I felt the insects were recognizing me in my synchronicities. It definitely feels unlike any other insect encounter you could imagine. I mean, it, it feels like there's an intelligence looking at me from those eyes. It's been almost a decade since my encounter with the Big Mantis on New Year's Eve, and I have spent years chasing this mystery. I've written three Mantis movies, story bibles, I have painted paintings, created music, all around this event in my life. Not to mention countless hours of researching, meditating, being obsessed and consumed by this enigma. To be honest, sometimes I wonder, am I wasting my time? Am I just wandering around in a big maze that really has no destination? It's eclipsed my life. My wife, Marcy, has, by proxy, lived all of this as well. No, I don't think it's a waste of time. It's like you're breaking new ground. Any explorer breaks new ground and people think they're crazy. I don't think he's crazy at all. It's not that I don't believe in these other realms. I actually think we're idiots not to believe in these other realms. I just have too much going on in this realm <laughs> to introduce other realms. Do I think he's crazy? No, I think that he's evolved to hold more realities than most of us do. I've never really thought much about the Manus experience other than when you brought it up when we, you know, three, four months ago, you know, when we connected around it. And it was like you were the one that kind of triggered in me, oh, yeah. And then, you know, we were kind of joking, well, whose Manus was taller, yours or mine? You know? <laughs> it, was, it was ontologically real for me. And I feel I've had other encounters with... Um, you know, hyperdimensional entities. But this was an encounter that was as close to the physical as I've ever experienced. It probably was profound at one level, but because I can I can situate my experience in this spectrum of all possible experiences people have had with mammoths, I think mine is kind of mundane. <laughs> you know, it's it's it literally, literally is like, oh, Stu got Stu got a major initiation. I just got a blood pressure reading. <laughs> <sighs> well, the night is young. <laughs> okay. And again, this is Lorelai, the shaman. I personally believe it's it's karmic. It's these beings have been with you for lifetimes. They were coming through, sort of gently knocking on the door because they're allies that you have and have had for a long time and they're here to assist you in that work because it's what we do, what they do. When people say, well, why would they want to do that? It's like, well, why do we want to help the earth? Why do we? Why do any of us want to do that? Because it's just, it's the right thing to do. It needs to be done. Siona. Uh, I'm not big on interpretations. I'll put it this way. The way that I've been able to maintain my sanity through it all, I think that's the best way to put it is just to understand that this is the process of this film coming into the world. Ultimately, the thing that, beh that is behind it is the mystery, that creative impulse that you talk about, that something from nothing. Like That is ultimately the thing that's behind it. And then proximally, like the prox you know, you have ultimate and proximal cause, and the proximate cause is just the movie, the film itself, and this is what it looks like for that movie to move through into the world through multiple beings and multiple bodies. You know, and it's our job as humans to keep showing up and uh, doing the work here. The last conversation that I had with Joel before he passed away, 
He told me, please don't compromise this film in order to get money. He said, Mantis is a special script. And it was a very unusual thing to hear from a line producer. I will never forget it. This is his wife, Jana, again. He would rarely say that to anybody. He was very picky about scripts. Yeah, I mean, I think it sort of is his gift. If this film is sort of your calling and everything and the universe sort of aligned you to meet him, like that is the sign, the imprint, like whatever you run into from here on in, always remember that. Keep your vision. Keep your vision. You know, you want to stay in touch with the thing that sings. If you compromise on the vision, there's no thing. And this was clearly a visionary work. You know, we talk about visionary works and that vision can come, you know, what that vision looks like, the route through which any vision appears um, can be different. But when you're in touch with a vision like that, like that is not the thing to compromise on. Everything else can be adjusted. There's a lot of love in the project. I think that that's the other piece takes a lot of love to keep showing up for it. I feel like that is, is at the heart of what Mantis is. Serena. If you were to tell me this story, I would be like, um, okay, that's weird. But the fact that I've actually experienced it, that it's happened to me, I'm just like, wow. It's just something magical and profound. I feel like Mantis is the call of my soul of what I'm supposed to do, but I have actual evidence of things showing up to support it all and it gives me the chills and it gives me goosebumps and it makes me cry at the same time of joy and the pure fact of a real connection with something so much bigger. At the time of this recording, Mantis, the film, is still 50% funded. As an artist, I will say, the Mantis years have been exceptional, maybe even transformative in some ways. I am ready to come out of the closet and say that Mantis entity that visited me on New Year's is my liminal muse. My experience has been positive, but I'm really aware that many lives are ruined by encounters with non-human entities. Some people's experiences are profoundly negative, and if we human beings were to do what Greys and some of these other entities do to people, we'd go to jail for the rest of our lives. Anytime an entity presents itself as some kind of higher guide, we should be suspicious and discerning. Trust should be built over years, and it should be conditional. I'm slowly beginning to trust my Mantis friend. It is conditional. My contact experience lasted about 60 seconds, and it led to three movie scripts, story bibles, paintings, music, countless hours of learning, creating. I feel passionately curious to speak with other artists who've experienced entities. I want to learn from others who've navigated this labyrinthine mindfuck. Delving the nuances of this puzzle, I learned that the adjective mantic comes from the Greek word mantikos, relating to divination. The combining form, mancy, means to divine in a particular manner, as in necromancy or pyromancy. Mancy is a relative of mantic. So is the word mania. Mania comes from the Greek manasthai, to be mad. I think that's a clue for those of us attempting mantis mancy. This puzzle leads beyond the rational. In ancient Greece, mancy or divination was often considered inspired madness, which I would argue is better than uninspired madness. <laughs> As an artist, I've long felt that the creative lineage is the primordial one. It gave us music, language, religion, civilization, every manifest thing on the inside and outside of the human experience was brought into being through the creative endeavor. That lineage was here before us, before stars, light, matter itself. Which may be why a non-human intelligence would take interest in a human artist. Because there's a common denominator there, creativity. The intersection between something and nothing, the point of all places that every artist inhabits. Maybe some non-human artists as well. She coughed new heart. Crawling under her canopy of crystal.
Enchanted Patreon, sensual patrons, passionate StuartDavis.com, love Patreon sex patrons, fleshly StuartDavis.com, enlightenment Patreon, carnal patrons, naked Patreon, nude StuartDavis.com, peace Patreon, fulfillment patrons, insight StuartDavis.com, Manhood Patreon Womanliness Patrons Erotic StuartDavis.com Heavy Petting Patreon Non-Duality Patron Chasm Spasm Orgasm StuartDavis.com